Okay, uh, shall we start, Edwin? Uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, very good. Um, hello and welcome to the National HBCU Blockchain Webinar Series brought to you by the Morgan's FinTech Center. And uh, my name is Ali Emdad, Associate Dean of the Graves Business School at Morgan, and also the Director of the FinTech Center. Just for your information, um, uh, today we will have a discussion for about 30, 40 minutes, uh, followed by a, a 20, 25 minute uh, Q&A session with the audience. Uh, now I have the honor and pleasure of presenting to you a global leader in FinTech who is from a global company, PayPal. Our guest is Edwin Aoki. Uh, Edwin is a PlayPal, PlayPal technology um, fellow and the CTO of PayPal's uh, blockchain, crypto, and digital currency unit. Uh, he is responsible for driving sustained growth and innovation in digital asset technology. Previously, Edwin spent nearly a decade as a Company at the, as the company's chief architect, tasked with uh, defining the company's long-term technology roadmap and architecture and advancing technologies that have enabled PayPal to become a global leader in FinTech. Before joining PayPal in 2010, Edwin was at Netscape and AOL for more than 13 years as a technology fellow and chief architect, overseeing the architecture and technology strategy for many of AOL's consumer facing products, including instant messaging, email, uh, mobile enterprise and developer programs. Ed Edwin uh, earlier was uh, in a position positions at Intuit and uh, Go Corporation and Apple Computer. Edwin graduated from Harvard College with a degree in sociology and computer science. He is a published author and holds several software patents. Um, I want to, to start uh, by uh, presenting this um, question, uh, Edwin, uh, PayPal announced that customers can check out with crypto and users of PayPal and Venmo can now buy, sell and hold cryptocurrencies. Why has PayPal decided to join the crypto market? And also, why is the selection limited to four cryptocurrencies? Right now it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and Bitcoin Cash, when there are so many other cryptocurrencies on the market. Oh, well, Ali, thank you very much for that uh, very uh, kind and generous intro. It's my pleasure and privilege to be here. You know, I, I, you know, I think that, that our uh, foray into cryptocurrencies and digital assets really is an extension of what PayPal has always done which is to try to use technology in a way that uh, brings financial services and grows the space for financial services to be more accessible, more inclusive and more efficient, uh, and really sort of give people new options into how they uh, pay and transact. And you know, I think that as we um, you know, saw the continuing trend towards digitization, especially brought about by the unfortunate events of uh, the pandemic and, and, and 2020, um, but really sort of preceding that and into uh, a greater uh, comfort and familiarity level with transacting online and, 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 and living more of our lives online, uh, it became really clear that the evolution of that was into digital assets and digital currency. And so we wanted to provide a, a way to extend uh, those options and those choices to our customers. Uh, and so we explored through partnerships, uh, investments, uh, and, and, and research conversations, including uh, both internally uh, and with uh, regulators and governments, 
Um, and we decided that uh, we wanted to go and, and, and address um, you know, this, this uh, uh, greater desire from our customers to be able to access and use uh, cryptocurrencies uh, in, a, in, a, um, uh, in an educated and, 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 and secure way. And so we uh, did a lot of work, including uh, speaking with our customers and the um, cryptocurrencies that sort of uh, rose to the top from that in terms of what they had said uh, that they were looking for uh, were uh, the four that you mentioned. Uh, and we were really pleased to be able to launch that product on uh, PayPal uh, back in the fall and on Venmo uh, just last month. Very good, thank you. Um, PayPal and Venmo had a strong 2020. What has cust uh, customer uh, reaction been like for <laughs> PayPal and uh, Venmo's crypto services uh, so far? Yeah, well, we've been really, really pleased uh, with the launch of our uh, cryptocurrency capabilities. Um, you know, we had high expectations uh, and the volumes traded on that platform uh, greatly exceeded uh, even those uh, lofty expectations. And, you know, I think we were especially pleased to see that that um, positive reaction came not only from our customers, but also from the ecosystem, which, you know, I think by and large saw our um, entry as a uh, you know responsible way to bring uh, more uh, participants into the into the space, uh, as well as by regulators who saw in many ways the same sort of thing. Um, we were really pleased to receive uh, New York's first conditional bit license as part of uh, our launch, um, and you know really to be able to take this uh, and, and and make this a, a uh, more um, uh, more of a mainstream sort of activity. Um, a couple of, uh, actually, I guess uh, a little over a month ago now, uh, we also launched um, uh, our Checkout with Crypto product, which allows uh, customers that are holding cryptocurrencies on our platform to be able to use that at checkout um, just about anywhere where uh, PayPal is accepted. Uh, and, you know, I think from that, uh, uh, the, the, the first transaction, which was our CEO buying a pair of cowboy boots to now um, you know, we've been really pleased with the uh, uh, uptake, and you know, I think that the that the uh, energy and the excitement that people are having at uh, having more choice and more options uh, when they uh, uh, transact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, as you know, crypto prices are known for their volatility. How does PayPal deal with and also prepare its customers? Uh, for the potential risks uh, that uh, are involved in with uh, using crypto? Yeah, well, no, certainly, uh, you know, historically volatility has been uh, uh, maybe a hallmark uh, of, of, of the cryptocurrency sphere and, and, and certainly uh, over the last few months, especially. You know, I, I think that we've done a few things. Um, first of all, in the checkout with crypto product that I, I mentioned, one of the things that we've done on the merchant side is that when a consumer goes and uses crypto at checkout, um, we essentially instantly sell that crypto, turn it into fiat currency, and we transmit fiat currency to the merchant. And so from a merchant perspective, they're completely insulated from any future price volatility or changes in the crypto market. It's as if they've received any normal PayPal transaction that might have been funded with uh, a PayPal balance or a debit or credit card from, from the uh, customer's point of view. And so we've completely neutralized the vo volatility argument as far as merchants are concerned. Um, they don't even need to know that the consumer is using crypto on the front end to pay for their purchases. And so uh, as far as they're concerned, there is no volatility uh, there. On the consumer side, you know, one of the things that uh, we've really emphasized as part of our product is that education. Uh, you know, certainly I think that there's a lot of excitement. Uh, there's a lot of hype about uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, and some of that hype actually comes from the volatility itself, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Bitcoin goes up by 10% or goes down by 10% makes a great headline. But one of the things that we've really emphasized in our product is to bring some of that uh, information and that education um, really front and center into the experience. Uh, we start off with some um, educational panels uh, and, and videos and materials so that customers can feel comfortable uh, with what they're doing and understand what they're participating in. And they can feel sort of connected to that broader 
uh, uh, digital currency ecosystem without getting deep into the technical aspects of the product. And you'll see that those are customized for a Venmo audience differently from a PayPal audience, for example. And so, you know, what we want to do is make sure that we're bringing that same ease of use and understanding and clarity that we've done in the rest of digital payments and digital assets into this space so that people feel comfortable, they feel educated and informed, uh, and they feel that, um, you know, that they know exactly what they're getting into and how to, to transact uh, with that uh, as well. And, you know, I think that as crypto becomes more and more uh, widely adopted, uh, as uh, utility grows uh, uh, and, and, and there are more things to do with that beyond just um, you know, uh, uh, holding on to it as a, as a capital investment. You know, we also think that uh, 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 volatility will uh, also hopefully smooth out a, a little bit as that, as that goes forward. Is there, is there a risk that people see crypto asset prices soaring at some point um, although they go down and up, and but in general, if there is a trend that they're soaring in in terms of um, uh, appreciation, um, and then they decide not to use it at at the checkout, instead uh, hold on to the crypto. Is PayPal or other um, uh, companies uh, like PayPal worried about that or not? No, I think that there's been. Um... Certainly, since I can remember, there's been this debate about uh, cryptocurrencies as a reserve currency versus a transaction currency, and sort of which one is it, and and you know, is it more like gold, where you know you don't really transact in gold these days, uh, or is it more like cash, which is more of that transaction currency? Uh, and I don't think that that's necessarily a um, you know an either or type of an activity. Um, one of the things that we are seeing is that some of the folks that um, you know have uh, been fortunate enough to uh, participate in the rise of the value of Bitcoin, uh, now feel like they have uh, a little bit more breathing room, uh, a little bit more uh, flexibility uh, in what they spend. And they're now using that in order to be able to, um, uh, you know, splash that a little bit or, or, or extend themselves a little bit to, to, to get something nice that, that they've wanted for a little while. And so, you know, I think like most investments, it, it, it goes both ways. Sometimes, you know, you will hold an asset, um, watch it appreciate for a long-term uh, gain, and sometimes you will um, uh, want to participate in that upside and then uh, use that for something else. Uh, and, and I think that we're seeing both of those uh, from our customer base. Um, uh, great. Uh, Edwin, can you uh, talk more about PayPal's uh, broader vision around blockchain, crypto, and digital currencies? How much time do we have, Ali? I mean, you know, very, very broad question. You know, I think that um, our, our view has always been, uh, as I said, that, you know, PayPal is, is, is in the business of uh, trying to make financial services uh, more accessible and more available to more people. And we think that digital currencies and digital assets really sort of feed into that very nicely. Um, you know, I mentioned that uh, 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 there was a huge acceleration in the move to online as a result uh, uh, in, in 2020. Um, some of that was uh, obviously by necessity. We were all sort of confined to our homes and uh, businesses needed a way to be able to reach their customers and continue to survive um, uh, despite uh, uh, the, the, the steps that we were taking to, to control the pandemic. Um, and you know, as folks got into that, that became not only just a necessity, but also became uh, a, a new sort of standard for convenience and, and for access. And so you know, we feel that um, you know, whether that is digital payments in the traditional sense or the work around blockchain, uh, uh, crypto and, and, and digital currencies, that there's an extension there. And we feel that we need to accelerate our efforts to help participate in that uh, shift and to help shape that in a way that's gonna be safe and friendly and, and, and accessible to our customers. And so, you know, we've started uh, with these uh, initial moves uh, in the cryptocurrency space uh, with buy, sell, hold. We extended that by increasing utility, uh, by being able to, to transact, about, uh, transact uh, with uh, cryptocurrencies. Right now that product's only available uh, in the US. Uh, and, you know, we've uh, also announced that we will be extending that to uh, other markets uh, later in the year. 
Uh, but we also think that there are other opportunities uh, in the space. Um, uh, for example, through um, you know, the uh, adoption and interoperability with uh, central bank uh, digital currencies, which uh, a, a number of governments uh, are, uh, are, are researching and, and, and talking to. And I think that you know, it's also the case that um, today's uh, existing uh, cryptocurrencies, certainly the four that you mentioned, um, you know, all do have some limitations when it comes to uh, being used as a transaction currency. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly the finality, um, you know, the cost uh, of, 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 of transaction and some of these consensus models, the speed and the throughput uh, that we have uh, uh, across those are um, you know, really challenging when you consider the you know, trillions and trillions of dollars that are moving every hour through the financial system as it is. And so you know, we also believe that there are going to be opportunities uh, technically uh, to work uh, with the ecosystem, to work with governments and regulators, uh, and to really listen to our customers to figure out you know, how to move this from where we are today, which is, I think, an exciting start, uh, into something that can um, serve as an upgrade for the ways that we transact and the ways that, that, that people can access the financial system. Are you, are you satisfied or happy with the rate of adoption of, uh, of crypto in, in general and also uh, focus on, on blockchain in particular outside of the fintech industry? Yeah, I, you know, I think I am satisfied uh, with, with the rate. I mean, I, I, again, I think that um, there is a, um, you know, th there's been a steady adoption. We, we uh, it, it's really interesting because, you know, something like Bitcoin as an example has both uh, seemingly been around forever and has really been in a blink of an eye, right? Uh, it sort of exploded on the scene uh, in the public sort of consciousness over the past uh, couple, three years. Um, it's been about a decade or so uh, since the first uh, uh, transaction. Um, and it's sort of interesting because you know, most new technology both sort of feels like uh, uh, it's always been there, but also feels like it's just on the verge of, 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 of really exploding. And so you know, I do think that the pace has been uh, uh, good. I think that you know, we're starting to get to the point where uh, larger uh, 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 players um, uh, greater parts of the financial ecosystem are starting to, to pay attention to that. Um, and I think that that's welcome. Uh, I, I think that having uh, measured regulation in this space that sort of provides for uh, guardrails for consumers and allows for innovation is going to be uh, uh, valuable. Uh, and, and I think that that's uh, all uh, sort of coming in due time. And, 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 and so I'm pretty uh, satisfied, I think, uh, with that. I'm actually especially uh, excited, though, about uh, what you mentioned, Ali, and some of the opportunities outside of, of, of the crypto space. Um, you know, we're already seeing um, blockchain being used uh, in consortium models for things like supply chain management and being able to, to, to trace the provenance of goods. Um, you know, uh, I'm particularly passionate about uh, blockchain as uh, a building block for, uh, no pun intended, as a foundation for um, digital ID and, and federated uh, identification mechanisms that allow for, um, you know, uh, uh, um, sort of more uh, um, uh, greater privacy, but also for, for um, you know, a greater participation in that space. Um, you know, as we like to say, there's no reason why the um, you know bartender at the uh, down at the at, at the local pub needs to know what my uh, eye color is and my address and my uh, uh, height just so that they can verify that I can uh, order a, a, a drink. Um, but that's what we do today, right? We hand over this piece of identification that has all of this other information on it, and you know through. Uh, blockchain technologies and distributed ID, we think that there's um, you know, real opportunities that we can expand that in a way that um, people have more control over the data that they disclose, uh, but that we're able to do that in a selective manner that um, you know, gives people what they need, uh, but also allows for people to be uh, uh, more judicious about the way that they, uh, that they present themselves. So th there are a lot of, I think, very exciting things that are going on in the, in, in the, crypt in the non-crypto uh, blockchain space, um, and uh, you know, 
some of those overlap with the and, and have an intersection with what we do and some of them uh, are, are completely separate um compared since uh since you have some um uh, understanding of the global market compared to to other countries um is the u.s um adoption rate uh on par with the rest of the world or are we falling behind or uh, what what do you think you know I, th I think it's early days um e everywhere um i think that you know if we look at Say central bank digital currencies as a as a proxy, um, you know, uh, from a maybe mainstreaming uh, of this, um, China is 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 probably the farthest ahead uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, central banks and, and and regulators sort of experimenting with that. They've had a number of public demonstrations um, of, of of their digital yuan uh, in the space. Uh, Sweden. Uh, just completed uh, a one-year uh, um, uh, set of trials um, uh, on the uh, what they call the e-krona, um, uh, their 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 digital currency. Um, we're seeing a lot of uptick uh, in Caribbean uh, uh, countries, Jamaica and the Bahamas, and and, and others uh, to to look at that. Um, and so I think that there's a, a lot of interest there. Uh, we've heard, um, you know, very recently comments from uh, the U.S. Fed, the um, the uh, European Central Bank, uh, and the, um, uh, the 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 board in the U.K. Um, about their interest in in in, in looking into this. Um, more broadly, in the digital currency space, you know, it is a worldwide uh, phenomenon. Um, people look at it for different reasons. Uh, some areas. Um, uh, they look at that, uh, you know, here in the United States, it is, it is uh, mostly ar around um, investment. Um, uh, in other uh, locations, it might be uh, that people are using it as a hedge against inflation uh, or, um, you know, other uh, uh, means to uh, participate in, in, in a financial system uh, that they don't have access to. So you know, I, I do think that it's a global phenomenon, um, but as I said, I think that it's still early days, uh, and, and, and so certainly too early to be picking uh, sort of winners and, uh, uh, and, and losers just yet. Very good. Um, also wanted to uh, ask a broader question, which is uh, near and dear to our hearts in higher education, and that's... Uh, mm -hmm. What uh, what set of skills do you think our students um, who want to get into the fintech industry should have? And also, what advice do you have for the universities who train the future workforce? Yeah, I, that's a great uh, question. I, I think that, you know, Decentralized protocols and, and, and digital currencies in general, I think, uh, are, are going to become more and more uh, part of the conversation. They're going to become uh, part of the, um, the, the environment in much the same way as the Internet sort of is today. Right. And, and so I think that, you know, when you ask the question, what do you need to sort of do in order to be uh, uh, competitive in, in, in a job market and in an Internet economy? Not everybody needs to understand TCP/IP. Not everybody needs to understand sort of exactly sort of the, the nuts and bolts of this. Although certainly there are going to be opportunities there. And so, you know, for people that want to get into those specialized areas, you know, there's going to need to be a um, you know more uh, cryptographers, more people in applied math and algorithms. Um, you know, to, to come up with the next set of consensus protocols, the next set of interoperability mechanisms. We'll want people that are well-versed in cybersecurity to be able to test and to verify and to secure uh, these mechanisms uh, and to be able to use things like AI and machine learning to be able to uh, detect fraud and, and, and perform transaction uh, monitoring uh, in the space uh, so that we can uh, uh, tamp down on uh, illicit activity. But those are going to be sort of a subset of the folks that are that are that are interoperating and, and interacting with, with these systems. And so uh, not everybody is going to need to be an expert in you know, multi-party communications. Um, but rather, there's going to need to be a, a, a real 
uh, uh, understanding of how these things then connect to real problems that people are having out there in the out, out here in the real world. Um, you know, we see, for example, a, a huge uh, need uh, for people that uh, have a high level understanding of this, so that we can make that more accessible to the rest of the general population and the 377 million odd folks that that, that access our platform. And so, you know, people will need to be uh, well versed in things like uh, user experience design uh, and, and, and mobile experiences and uh, uh, the, the same kinds of cybersecurity and, and uh, uh, infrastructure scaling and, and, and availability and reliability techniques that, um, you know, are, are, are part of the rest of the Internet economy. Um, we think that there will need to be folks, um, you know, in the economics fields that will want to understand sort of how incentive models and how uh, things like um, monetary policy can be influenced and affected when you have a central bank digital currency that maybe has a different path of reaching people than, um, you know, than, than, than traditional fiat does. Uh, when we look at, um, you know, some of the, you know, as I said, as you mentioned, my background is in, in both computer science and sociology. And, you know, there are a huge, uh, potentials around social impacts that 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 we can have, um, you know, if we're able to uh, increase accessibility to financial systems and financial um, uh, institutions um, through things like that. And 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 so, what does this have to do with you know, or or how can you strengthen uh, poverty alleviation programs or uh, benefit programs in a way uh, with with these sorts of things? And so. Uh, coming back to your question, I think that there's both uh, specialized knowledge in, in, in some of these very um, uh, technical and, and, and math and cryptography oriented areas. Uh, but I also think that being able to have a, a high level understanding of, 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 of what blockchains are, which I, I know that your audience uh, very well does, um, being able to understand how they um, uh, uh, apply to sort of generalized distributed systems thinking, um, and then being able to bring that into a, a wider realm of um, uh, computer applications, social applications, economics applications, um, you know, uh, is, is, is going to be key to making sure that as these technologies grow, uh, that, that we're going to do them in a way that is uh, consistent with our values and, and consistent with the way that, that we want to expand opportunity. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Edwin, if you allow us, um, I want to introduce our um, colleague, uh, Sanjay Bhatna, who's the Associate Director of the FinTech and also the Chair of the Information Science and Systems Department at Morgan at, at the Grave School. And uh, we, we get um, some questions from the audience, and uh, I've requested Sanjay assist us with that. So he'll... Uh, uh, as uh, people type in the questions, uh, we're requesting that use the Q&A section, uh, which is at the bottom of uh, the screen. Use that uh, to post your questions uh, for Edwin. And also um, identify um, yourselves, what universities you're from, what, uh, uh, as, uh, along with your, your question. So with that, uh, Sanjay. Uh, hi, Edwin. Uh We've got uh, quite a few questions, so I'll take one of the questions and also add my bit, uh, my question to that too. So this comes from Dr. Sudhir Trivedi, professor and chair. Uh, the question is, may I know what percentage of PayPal customers uh, use crypto uh, on a, let's say on a given month? And are we seeing more involvement of institutionals institutions interested in discussing with PayPal on using your uh, infrastructure. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, very nice to meet you, Sanjay. Um, I should probably start off by, by, by mentioning that um, uh, we're actually in a financial quiet period uh, at, at PayPal. So I'm not gonna be able to answer specific uh, statistical questions about PayPal's, um, uh, things like PayPal's numbers uh, as, as, as the good doctor's question uh, implies, but I can, mentioned that you know we are seeing uh, as i said uh, a great uptick uh, exceeding our expectations and one of the things that's really interesting uh, that we have previously mentioned is that customers who do purchase and, and use cryptocurrency 
are engaging with our application uh, at a rate that's uh, more than twice as, as, as much as uh, they did previously. Uh, and, and so what we're seeing is that there is, um, you know, both uh, higher than expected uh, involvement with the platform and acceptance of the platform. And those folks are, are finding new ways and finding new opportunities to get connected in with, um, uh, with, with PayPal and the other services that we offer. Um, to your question around um, uh, institutional uh, investment, we're certainly seeing a huge uptick in both um, uh, institutional interest uh, as well as, as, as corporates. Um, you know, I think that uh, the, the, the two or the three, I should say, uh, companies that have been most in the news in terms of holding PayPal, uh, sorry, holding PayPal, holding crypto on their balance sheet uh, include MicroStrategies, uh, Square and Tesla. Um, uh, there is some, uh, you know, uh, Tesla uh, uh, released their uh, earnings report uh, 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 yesterday and, and uh, um, you know, some of the analysis suggests that about $100 million of their revenue was actually booked as a result of uh, movements in the price of, of, of the Bitcoin that they're holding. Um, so, you know, certainly I think that we're seeing, um, you know, large uh, uh, companies like, like BNY Mellon or, or, or JP Morgan Chase starting to have an interest in this, in this space. Um, and that institutional investment, um, you know, again, I think is going to... Um, uh, uh, allow us to um, start uh, bringing uh, more scale uh, into this area, um, and 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 also to um, you know really help us to solidify what the uh, rules of the road and 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 what the regulations should be uh, in that space. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Kobe Johnson, uh, a sophomore finance student, and this deals with. Uh, how companies such as Visa, Square, they are rumored to be using the blockchain infrastructure or getting into that? Has PayPal any, uh, uh, <clears throat> is it looking at doing a similar thing that is integrating blockchain into the infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, blockchain is really, we see blockchain as just a tool like any other sort of tool in the, in, in, in the computer science uh, sort of realm. Um, and so where it's appropriate for us to use distributed ledgers and, 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 and to do that, um, we certainly will. Um, I mentioned digital ID as, 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 as one area, which you know, I think and that we think is particularly exciting in that, in that regard. Um, We've actually had, uh, you know, internally within PayPal uh, for for some years now, a, a a project we're using a we're using a blockchain based token to do uh, employee recognition, um, uh, which uh, we call that. Wow, it's been it's been really interesting um, because what it allows us to do is to sort of award um, these points. We call them points to to, to employees. Um, uh, and they can then gift those to uh, other employees. So if somebody does a, a code review, for example, and, and, or, or answer a question on your behalf, um, uh, I can say, hey, that was really great. Mary, here, have 100 wow points uh, as, as thanks for that. And, um, and, and then Mary can go and, 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 and spend those points for um, experiences with our, with our executive team or in, in some cases to... Um, uh, to, to, to get some swag. Um, and one of the things that we're finding that's really interesting about that is that it really democratizes the rewards and recognitions process. So it's not that you know, our employees need to have a manager sort of thank them and, and recognize them for the work that they do, but we actually uh, create more of a, of a model where employees can, can, can recognize each other in a meaningful uh, uh, way. Uh, and so we sort of look for ways that we take blockchain technology and, and incorporate those all across um, our, our, our sphere where that makes sense. Um, uh, uh, you know, whether that's again in the, in the cryptocurrency space or, uh, or elsewhere. Thank you. That's very innovative and employee uh, recognition trading platform. <laughs> Yeah, we really, you know, we really like that because again, it, 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 it changes the dynamic a little bit so that, you, you know, again, it, it allows people to um, recognize each other for the little things that happen every day, as opposed to waiting for, for, for some larger thing. And I think 
I don't think I'm giving away, well, maybe I'm giving something away here, but that's okay. We're, we're uh, hoping to open source that platform later in the year. So uh, hopefully we'll see a little bit more on that uh, soon. Very good. The next question is from Atma Sahu from Coppin State University in Baltimore. And this question really deals with uh, comparison of different platforms such as PayPal uh, with Coinbase, Binance, uh, Trust Wallet, et cetera. If, if you can shed some light. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, certainly um, Coinbase is obviously one of the, the larger sort of retail platforms out there, especially uh, uh, with a lot of um, news since they're, uh, since they're offering. Um, was that only last week? I think that was last week. Uh, time really flies in this, uh, in this field. You know, I, I think that um, our hallmarks really have been around um, the ability to educate our customers and to provide a, uh, an on-ramp for folks who are curious about this space, uh, who may have, may have heard about it and are looking to get involved in it, um, but don't know where to start. Uh, and we provide through PayPal, I think, a, uh, a trusted um, and, um, uh, and, and, and easy to use uh, system that allows them to sort of start to get, to get their feet wet uh, in this space. Uh, as I mentioned, we've spent a lot of time on the human factors Part of that, we've spent a lot of time on the um, on the education, um, and uh, you know it's an environment that people are in many cases already familiar with. And so, um, if you already uh, have an account with, with with PayPal, there are no additional uh, fees to sort of onboard funds into that. Uh, you can go and get started um, uh, buying and selling crypto um, uh, uh, in, in in moments. And then on the other side of that, um, through the integration with Checkout, um, you actually have an opportunity to then use that and spend that um, you know, at, at, at tens of millions of merchants that are part of the PayPal ecosystem. So you know, I think that, that we're really catering to an audience that um, is, 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 is looking to sort of start in this space, is looking to, um, uh, to get engaged uh, with the cryptocurrencies, and to be able to, to, to use those and, and, and to gain utility out of it. Um, if folks are looking for one of the hundreds of long tail uh, currencies uh, and, and coins that are out there, um, we're probably not the platform uh, for them. Um, if folks are looking to, you know, um, to, to, to get involved in the um, uh, most, uh, uh, the, the newest and the riskiest, um, uh, sort of DeFi uh, types of experiences, uh, we're probably not not the platform for them. So, you know, I, I think that we're trying to go after um, uh, really a mass market uh, space and, um, uh, and 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 to be able to bring that uh, to uh, to a broad population. And PayPal's always been a market leader in the fintech space, so there's some advantage uh, right from there. Uh, that, next right. question is from uh, Linda Lubert. Uh, professor and chair uh, in the economics department at Morgan State University. And this uh, uh, deals with the adoption of uh, cryptocurrencies in different nations and maybe even deals with uh, central bank uh, digital currencies. So what's the role of privacy for this adoption? And is, uh, are you seeing any changes in countries with the very strong privacy laws? Yeah, Professor Libra, that's a great uh, question, uh, and and certainly we're seeing a lot of uh, of, of discussion about this, um, particularly from our uh, colleagues in uh, Europe, where uh, privacy laws and, and and the right to privacy tends to be a, a little bit more um, more front and center. Um, you know, uh, there is a real uh, I, I think opportunity um uh, and 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 challenge uh, when it comes to cryptocurrencies and 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 privacy um the opportunity comes from you know the ability to use um the presence uh, of the blockchain itself to be able to do things like have better tracing for money laundering or terrorist financing uh and and, and other activities where um you know, a lot of the key to being able to crack down on things like uh, human trafficking uh, or the drug trades or things like that um, really is about sort of following the money. And it's really um, uh, 
uh, more straightforward, at least on a pure transaction by transaction basis, to follow the money using a blockchain than it is, uh, you know, in, in in the traditional financial sphere. And so there's an opportunity there, I think, that that, that we can get into um, uh, more effective means of, of of being able to prevent some of these illicit usages, which is kind of ironic given sort of Bitcoin's original uh, reputation as being used for for these purposes. Um, at the same time. Um, you know, we need to do that in a way that preserves privacy so that if I'm, you know, going and, um, you know, making purchases of, uh, I, I don't know, maybe, uh, 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 you know, I'm, I'm buying a stroller or a playpen or something that that does not become fodder for digital advertising to then go and, 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 and realize that I'm, you know, I, I, I might be expecting a, a, a child. Um, and, and so I think that there is a tension and there is a, a real um, emphasis on trying to figure out how we balance those two concerns uh, and how we make sure that when we're looking at the uh, data on, on, on transactions and the movement of funds, that we're not also pulling in um, you know, uh, 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 behavioral or other sorts of things that would allow um, that data to then be uh, associated and 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 and, and, and um, sort of cross-referenced uh, for for uh, uh, intentions that or for for other intentions and and I think that um, central banks uh, regulators uh, and you know responsible parties like PayPal I think are all interested in 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 finding that right balance and that's going to be one of the key technical uh, things that 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 we're going to be paying attention to as we look to. Um, really help shape and and and, and drive the space forward. Thanks. Uh, there's a question from uh, Kitsi, and this question is: In future, is there a possibility of utilizing quantum computing to improve blockchain technology to build more safe uh, payment uh, to avoid fraud, or is it the, just the other thing? Quantum opens up. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's a really interesting uh, question. Of course, y y you know, quantum is that uh, at least sort of the, 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 the promise of quantum or the, or, or the premise of quantum is that double-edged sword where, um, you know, uh, increased computing power can really sort of create new opportunities and, and you know, potentially um, make it a lot easier and, and a lot cheaper and a lot more accessible to be able to do interesting things like um, you know, more complex uh, consensus protocols. On the other hand, uh, it has the opportunity to uh, break certain encryption practices and to, and to brute force uh, encryption mechanisms that really are at the foundation uh, of these. Um, and so, you know, I, I, again, I think that this is, <laughs> it's still pretty early. Um, we do see that um, uh, privacy protecting encryption uh, Differential disclosure, some of these things, um, which really do require quite a lot of computing power, um, and would be on the whole desirable as we move into the space, um, are going to be areas where quantum may very well uh, give us new tools that we can use to to bring more of that technology and sophistication into the into the area. Uh, at the same time, we need to be constantly aware. Um, and, and constantly able to sort of move our uh, move the bar higher, so that as uh, you know, compute power increases and improves, um, that we're going back and making sure that all of the um, all of the encryption and the secrets management that we've had that were predicated on a particular level of computing power being unattainable or or being impractical, um, uh, that that we're continuing to move along with that, and so uh, those are going to be the the, the, the key areas, I think, that, um, you know, as we do research in quantum um, and, and, and as we work with the rest of the industry to do that, um, that, that we're going to be um, really looking again to strike that balance there between the areas where uh, quantum can help and, 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 and where quantum could, could put some certain assumptions at risk. Uh, quantum is the double edged sword, and uh, yeah, hopefully with uh, more research and more progress, uh, it'll become of utility to instead of the other side. Uh, the next question is from uh, uh, 
Caleb Davis, uh, MBA student from Houston uh, Tillotson University. And this deals with the blockchain uh, being used really by the alumni. Hmm. Uh, so how can higher education use the NFTs to make a gamified and tokenized microeconomy to incentivize alumni for uh, giving back? Wow, that's a that's a great uh, that's a great question, uh, uh, Caleb. And and you know, I I would invite you to sort of uh, engage with us on sort of a, 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 an exploration of, of of some of those activities. But you know, I, I think that there's two aspects to that. Um, one comes back to this idea of, um, of 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 transparency and visibility, um, which is not necessarily related to NFTs per se, but um, you know, one of the things that we really recognize is that when, um, whether it's alumni or, 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 or people that are, um, you know, participating in, in, in charitable giving or, or, or other sorts of uh, tasks, um, there's, you know, they, they want to see that their involvement actually results in something. And, and, and so uh, if I were to give a, a donation, for example, to my um, alma mater, um, I'd really rather that it went towards uh, academic programs rather than, say, you know, uh, ad administrator salaries. No offense to any of the administrators that, that, that may be on the call. Um, and being able to have some amount of transparency into that and being able to use the programmability of these tokens in a way that allows me to really uh, specify in a much more uh, meaningful and, and, and machine readable way sort of exactly how I want those, those funds to be used, I think is... Is, is actually part of the next generation of what giving is gonna, is gonna look like. Um, when you add in things like NFTs uh, to that, um, you know, certainly I think that there is a opportunity as we're seeing with things like um, NBA Top Shots uh, to be able to uh, capitalize on, on, on some of these, uh, the, the, the moments and the, and, the, and the nostalgia that comes from, from being part of that. So you can certainly imagine that if you are uh, you know, you were at a, uh, uh, um, you know, at, at, at a, uh, uh, you were present at a, at a pivotal moment in, in, in a football game or a basketball tournament, uh, and you wanted to be able to capture that moment as an NFT and, and use that in a way to engage uh, alumni. That's certainly something that you can do. Um, you know, I, I, I think that um, you could certainly extend that um, even uh, uh, to areas where you know, you could potentially use things like NFTs to uh, incentivize research, uh, and and to be able to use that in a way that allows you to to, to uh, tokenize and fractionalize uh, academic research and, and and institutions in that in that fashion. So I th I think that there's a lot of opportunities uh, and engagement there. But um, these are the kinds of ideas I think in the kinds of 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 areas where. Um, you know, we're just getting started in, in this space, uh, and uh, you know, it's ideas like uh, like like the ones from from your uh, uh, questioner there that 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 I think are going to start fueling innovation in this area. Uh, your thing about uh, creating an NFT to for uh, academic research that is disruptive. Absolutely, uh, there's so many <laughs> disruptive things coming up coming about due to this new, new technology. So yes, one question, and this is a very basic question, uh, but I think for the audience, uh, it's important to know this. And this question is from Dr. Sudhir Trivedi, professor and chair. Uh, the question says that blockchain requires trust and there's no trust without authentication. Therefore, how, how uh, is it possible to have this ID a requirement showed an ID that does not really have this authentication. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, it is interesting because blockchain both does and does not require trust, right? It, it is interesting because, you know, the, the, the distributed sort of mechanism uh, is based on, an, on, on a notion that you can verify claims without necessarily trusting the others, other party and the, and the other individual. And so, um, you know, the example that I referenced uh, earlier at the, at, at the, at the bar, um, you know, is one of a, of a notion called self-sovereign ID. Uh, and the idea there is that uh, you can go back and verify with the, um, you know, with some authority, the uh, uh, information that is uh, stored on the blockchain. You would, 
necessarily need to make a determination of your own whether or not you trust that authority. Um, but then you can uh, uh, selectively disclose or selectively uh, provide that. And so you could imagine an identity blockchain, and again, hypothetically, you can imagine a, an identity blockchain that gets contributed to by, say, a state or government agency that verifies your uh, name and your age uh, uh, and, and maybe your, um, you know, some, 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 some ID number, like a, like a social security number. Um, uh, your university or your college could then add to that and say that you, know, you graduated at a particular time or you are enrolled in a degree program at a, at a, in a particular place. Um, your employer might then add to that and say that you are uh, or were employed uh, in a particular role in a particular place. And you know, when I went then to, um, you know, to, 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 to the bar, um, I'd say, hey, give this particular person my photo and my age. And you know, the, the, the bartender could receive that in some, in some form. They could verify that it's me. They could see what the age is and that the age is certified by my, my, my state authority or, or, or my driver's license or whatever that is. That's all they get, but that's all they need. They just need to know that, that, that that's there and, and they can then decide that that state authority is gonna be um, uh, who they trust for that. Now, at the same time, it could, I get my, my fictional little brother to certify that I'm a particular age. Um, and you know, the bartender might look at that and say, I have no idea who this person is. And so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna trust that particular uh, activity. And I think that um, you know, when we look at the overlay between um, you know, things like reputation services, um, uh, uh, trusted third parties and, and others, um, that's where I think that, that, that you're able to use this, the distributed nature of blockchain to really take trust uh, and to bring that um, uh, 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 across, uh, 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 across this ecosystem. Um, you know, it's, it is not the case, I think, that everybody is just going to necessarily or should trust everything that, 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 that's on the blockchain for a given individual, um, but that it, it allows customers and, 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 and individuals to... Um, selectively uh, uh, disclose and to selectively trust the pieces of, of, of uh, identity that they, that they need. Very good. Uh, and here, here's one very excellent question from Roshan Miller, a junior student at Morgan State University. So the question is, uh, uh, you know, in case PayPal wanted to add more currencies, what are the characteristics they would look for to add, let's say the next, cryptocurrency that may be available. So what's the vetting process? Do you look, look at speed efficiency, other aspects? Yeah, I mean, certainly we look, um, you know, we, we're we always sort of trying to respond to our, our, our customers here. Um, we are trying to look for ways that, um, you know, for, for, for coins that are going to, to sort of match in and have that um, utility to, to be able to have, um, you know, su sufficient uh, liquidity to make sure that, that, that that's going to be something that is, um, you know, that, that that's durable and safe for our customers. Um, we uh, uh, look for um, uh, regulatory uh, uh, characteristics and acceptance. So we, we want to make sure that, um, you know, we are uh, in full compliance uh, with our obligations as a financial institution uh, to do that. Uh, and it's, Almost certain that at some point we will we will look to add uh, additional tokens, um, but again we, we we go through a fairly uh, um, extensive vetting process that that really starts with what our customers are asking for. Uh, and so, um, if there are folks out there who, who who use our product today and 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 who uh, 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 would like us to, to to support one token or another. Uh, uh, please feel free to um, you know, give us that feedback and, 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 and we will absolutely consider that. A follow-up question on that, and this is from uh, Mohammed Salam. At, uh, he's a professor of computer science at uh, Southern University, Baton Rouge in Louisiana. So the question is, uh, what's the difference between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash uh, along with the future of these cryptocurrencies? And is pay PayPal allowing both to be traded. Yeah, so Bitcoin, 
uh, cash is, 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 is essentially a fork of, uh, of, of, of the original Bitcoin um, from, a, from a few years back where there were some disagreements in, in the governance and the oversight of, of the model. Um, and we see some of these forks from time to time, um, uh, even in, in, in the established uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, and uh, you know, I think that, that at this point, both of them are, 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 are viable um, uh, and, 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 and with their own sort of uh, communities and, and um, uh, 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 sort of benefits uh, to them. So, you know, again, I think that, that when we were looking at the, at the currencies and the coins that we wanted to support, um, you know, Bitcoin Cash was certainly one of the, the, the more prominent ones that, that, that our customers were asking for. Um, I think that that bodes well for, uh, for, 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 for BCH as, a, you know, as, a, as an ongoing uh, ecosystem. Uh, we'll take one last question. And uh, this question uh, is uh, really uh, deals with how to make this uh, onboarding experience of retail customers with PayPal, et cetera, uh, more frictionless. For instance, each one has a different KY, uh, know your customer. Are there any uh, efforts to get blockchain type of intermediaries uh, that just tie into the existing systems to handle the uh, FINRA regulations, KYA, et cetera, anti-money laundering? Yeah, I mean, again, I think that, um, uh, and I think the answer differs a little bit whether or not you're referring to the uh, know your customer, the know your business requirements for crypto specifically versus just in, in general and participation in the financial space. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned, at least for, for us, for our merchants, um, there, there is no additional work that they need to do in order to accept crypto because they're, they're, they're not actually technically accepting crypto. They're just accepting PayPal and customers can choose to, um, to, to execute an immediate sale of their, of their cryptocurrency at the, at the point of checkout. Um, but if the question is more broad in, in terms of sort of being able to use blockchain in general, as I said, you know, one of the challenges I think that merchants have, uh, especially small business um, in, in getting onto any financial platform. Uh, and, and you know, I think that PayPal does a better job than many, uh, but we still certainly have requirements for documentation and to be able to, 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 to produce uh, certain um, forms of identification and, 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 and documentation as, as people on board on the platform. Um, and as more and more of those things become digitized, perhaps through blockchain technology, we think that this will become easier as well. You know, one of the things uh, that, that that's maybe a little bit related to this is that, um, you know, we saw during the pandemic uh, last year, um, PayPal was one of the you know, one of two uh, non-bank institutions that was authorized to provide uh, paycheck protection loans, PPP loans uh, to small business. Um, and one of the tragedies, I think, of of of, of the PPP program, which on the, on, on the whole, I think was, was seen as a, as a success, is that especially in that initial tranche, um, uh, because uh, of the compressed nature of the timelines and of the funding, um, a lot of those funds went to businesses that had established relationships with their banks and, and, and with bankers. And that really cut out a lot of smaller businesses and, and individuals who, um, didn't necessarily or weren't necessarily plugged into the traditional bank economy. Uh, many uh, businesses that were run by people of color or minorities, uh, uh, women-owned businesses, people that have sort of privately funded and invested in their own in their own small businesses and didn't have uh, a tie to a bank, um, found that they were not able to, to, to get access to these loans. And a number of those folks came to PayPal uh, to get those uh, PPP loans. And, and, and we did a I want to say like $2 billion worth in, in, in PPP loans in the, in the first tranche alone. Um, and, you know, again, part of that was around being able to have the documentation requirements and other things that, that the banks required in order to be able to get that relationship and get those things going. And we found that through our platforms and through the use of technology, we were able to streamline that for a lot of people, increase the inclusiveness and the accessibility to that. And we think that, um, you know, the, the increased digitization hopefully will improve access uh, and to improve uh, the speed and the efficiency of these things so that we can reach more and more people. So this is an area definitely of research and, and, and of interest in ours and, and something that we think uh, 
uh, is is another potential of 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 this technology to make uh, to make financial services more available to people. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you so much, um, Edwin. Uh, this concludes the, the this session of the National Blockchain Webinar Series that was brought to you by the FinTech Center at Morgan, uh, Morgan State University. Um, again, um, thank you, Edwin, for a fascinating, informative, and thought-provoking uh, discussion. Uh, thank you to all the faculty and students and the administrators for taking time to participate uh, and ask questions. Uh, thank you to everyone who worked behind the scenes to make this happen. Um, I would like to uh, to thank Ripple for their support of the ongoing activities at Morgan uh, FinTech Center. And also at, um, uh, my thanks to uh, Morgan State University for the continued support of the center. Um, the uh, recording of this session will be uh, available on our website, uh, fintech.morgan.edu. So, and also I'd like to uh, invite you to please join us um, as uh, the, uh, the webinar series continues uh, for the, uh, the last one uh, will be this Thursday, April 29th, featuring uh, Congresswoman Stacy Plaskett um, of uh, the Virgin Islands. Uh, she's a member of uh, the Congressional blockchain caucus and she will talk uh, talk about laws regulations and the u.s competitiveness in fintech uh, thanks again be well and see you next time